Congregational Church. Church. We, are, we are part of the United Church of Christ, and we extend to you this invitation that no matter who you are or where you are on your life journey, you are welcome here. So a very special welcome to our visitors and guests. We are so honored by your presence today. And as always, we want to extend a warm welcome to all who are worshiping with us online from actually around the world. But this week, I heard from some folks who worship with us online from Ohio and from Texas and from Panama City, Florida. So if you're with us today, a warm welcome to you all as well. You will see here in our pews on the inside, there are some red tablets. If you would please pick those up, sign in, let us know of your presence today. And as you send them down the pew, as I always say, be sure to check the names of folks around you so you can greet each other by name during and following our service. Speaking of following our service, we hope that all of you will come to our fellowship hall for a time of some informal conversation and some refreshments. For those of you visiting for the first time today, our fellowship hall is right through those double doors, and we would love to have you come in so that we can more informally welcome you. A couple announcements. Major one for me is next Saturday is our annual hunger vigil and now our annual Festival of the Flea event in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. I am once again going up into the tower and I will stay there until we raise five tons of food. Last year I got a little worried, I have to admit, when the Festival of the Flea packed up and left me and the parking lot emptied and so forth. So my goal is for all of you to be there by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, okay? Come as early as you can. Try to get me down before Festival of the Flea leaves. It was pretty lonely up there. And people like Aldo and Steve Wyrick were running out to GFS to buy big poundage of rice. So I hope that all of you will come, bring food, or we really do encourage you to bring money as well. One dollar can provide six meals for the hungry here in Miami. And just a word about the hungry. If you look on page 13 of your bulletin, there's some statistics there about the hungry and food scarcity here in Miami. But the statistic I want you to hear the most is that 240,000 190 children go to bed hungry in South Florida each night. That is an appalling statistic, and I hope that we can just do our little part to help that, that cause. Also, if you have not reserved your table for the Festival of the Flea, please do come on into the Fellowship Hall. We'll sign you up. Um, your trash may be someone's treasure, so come and clean out your house and sell some items and we'll have just a, a wonderful day next week. Also, as you know, we have declared the WISE team, this is the year of empathy in the life of this congregation. We are looking at what it means to be empathetic, what empathy is all about, how are we empathetic to others, especially those we disagree with or we don't understand. So this next week, we're kicking off that program Wednesday night, we are doing a book study on the book, There is No Good Card for This. The book is for sale in the fellowship hall after worship. Even if you haven't read it, do come. It begins at 6.30 p.m. in our church library. And then next Sunday, we have a professor from UM who has done some definitive studies on empathy and forgiveness and reconciliation. And he will be here to kick off our empathy boot camp with the theme Empathy 101. Rest of the announcements are in your bulletin. Please take a look, and as I always say as well, join us for any of those. We're always glad to have folks participate. Now you will see I am, and I'm not in regulation uniform today, because I am going to the Sunday school, one of my favorite things, to hang with our children. So I will see you afterwards in the fellowship hall. Have a wonderful, amazing worship time together and know that God's Spirit is here 
here among us, celebrating with us as we gather now in a time of worship. to worship. The Spirit of God danced over the waters of creation, shaping love from chaos. The Spirit of God parted the waters of the sea, revealing love's power to free us. The Spirit of God hovered over Jordan's waters, declaring a love that has no limits. The Spirit of God comes to us in the gift of water proclaiming you are my beloved. The Spirit of God asks this day and always that you would simply allow yourself to be loved.
exodus, baptism, tempest. We follow the trail of the trail of water in our scriptures and see how much God cares for God's people. Whether providing water, saving people from it, immersing them in it or calming it, God uses water as a vivid sign of providence, deliverance, and grace. We give you thanks, O God, for water. In the joy of our unity, in the hope of our life together, in the love that we share as God's children, let us greet one another in the name of Christ, saying, The peace of Christ be with you. Little one, the water poured over you today has been part of the world since its beginning and will be until its end. It quenches the thirst of the gasping and cools the throats of the parched. It washes the world clean. It lets the world live. Drink deep, little one. Soak it up. Spirit of new life, it's yours now.
ones we gather now to celebrate the gift of grace through the sacrament of baptism. As we do, we we remember these words from Scripture. They were bringing children to Jesus that Jesus might bless them, and the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, Jesus was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the realm of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the realm of God like a child shall not enter it. And Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God, inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only to us, but also to our children. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church, the sign and seal of their participation in God's love, and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. Alexander and Alexei, as the parents of this child, is it your desire to have him baptized into this Christian community? If so, please respond, it is. It is. Will you encourage your child to learn from the wisdom of the prophets, doing justice, loving mercy, Mm -hmm. and walking humbly with his God? If so, please respond, we will. Will you foster for your child an appreciation for the life and teachings of Jesus in concert with an appreciation for diverse religious traditions? If so, please respond, we will. Will you teach your child to honor the faith questions that belong to him throughout his life? If so, respond, we will. Clara, as Godparent, Will you journey with this child and his parents to discover the wonder of God's love made manifest here this day? If so, please respond, I will. I will. And do you promise to care for this child by your actions and style of life, teaching him the joys of God's world, loving him, and forever being inseparably bound to him? If so, please respond, I do. I do. Will the congregation please stand? Jesus calls us to welcome children into the full life of our community, opening our table and hearts to those most vulnerable and offering the wisdom of the ages to all who hunger for truth. Do you, who witness and celebrate this sacrament, promise your love, support, and care of this child and to his parents as they live and grow in this Christian community? If so, please answer, we promise our love, support, and care. We promise our love, support, and care. Let us pray. God of wonder and grace, we thank you for your love revealed here in this moment as these parents, this congregation, and you come together making covenant promises. We pray that we will have the grace to uphold the promises made here this day, providing a safe shelter of your love in which this child may grow into the fullness of his life. We pray that these parents may continue to feel the sweet wonder of your presence so transparent here and that their child will bask in your love as he makes his own journey through this life. And so we would ask now that you bless by your Holy Spirit this water, bless all who touch and taste this water, that they may be ever reminded of your abiding presence and claim on their lives. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And what name shall this child be called? Maxime Alexeyevich Laganov. Hey, Maxime. Maxime. I baptize you now in the name of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, the mother and father of us all, child of God, disciple of Christ, and newest member of Christ Church, you are now baptized. And may God bless you and watch over you every day of your life. And all of the people of God say, Amen.
please join me in welcoming our newest baptized member. Friends, let us pray. God of heaven and earth, in Jesus' baptism, you spoke Jesus' true identity as your child, the beloved with whom you are well pleased. Help us remember that Jesus' baptism is an invitation to each of us to be raised to new life in Christ. In baptism, our identity as beloved children of God is made visible, and we become brothers and sisters in Christ. As part of God's family, our hearts are opened to pray for one another. For those among us who carry a heavy burden into the new year, hear our prayer. For those who grieve a diagnosis or death. For those who are restless or sad or unsatisfied and cannot put a name on that feeling. Hear our prayer. For those who feel alone. for those living in harm's way or those recovering from an act of violence. For those who are sick. For each one of us who needs your strength and guidance daily.
We pray this in the name of the one who taught us how to pray and love one another. Amen. I'm currently in a season of 21st century fasting. Like many of you, I have made New Year's resolutions to eat less and healthier. In our age of overabundance, it is not an easy promise to keep. Choosing to eat less is an interesting concept. For most of us, it's a lifestyle choice. However, for many in our community, hunger is not chosen, but a reality they are forced to live with. According to Feeding South Florida, and as you can see in the back of your program, 19% of our neighbors in Miami-Dade County suffer from food insecurity. As Christians in the wealthiest country in human history, I believe it is our duty to care for those who are hungry and homeless. While there are many examples of American Christianity being comfortable with injustice, I am thankful to belong to this church community, where compassion for the vulnerable is a core value. With that in mind, I'm looking forward to next Martin Luther King Jr. weekend when our congregation will be hosting its annual hunger vigil. Once again, Pastor Lori will head up to the church tower to be locked in until we raise five tons of food. I'm so thankful for Pastor Lori's prophetic witness. This year, I'm excited that part of this collection will be going to my employer, the Miami Rescue Mission. At the mission, our vision is that no one is homeless. We walk the talk by providing comprehensive services to homeless adults and children, including feeding hundreds of people every day. Your generous donation next week will make that possible. If you have any questions about the Hunger Vigil, I will be hanging out after service. Hope to see you all there. I leave you with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. God never intended for one group of people to live in superfluous, inordinate wealth, while others live in abject, deadening poverty. Will the ushers please come forward to receive the morning offering? <laughs>
Together we dedicate these gifts, generous God, like the sun that draws water from the earth so that it may return as rain, so your love moves us to return to you what you have first given us. May our offering be an embodiment of your love for all. Amen. You may be seated. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last Sunday, we joyfully celebrated Epiphany as wise ones followed a star, journeying for over two years to find the one whom the heavens proclaimed to them at the home of Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. Today, we fast forward three decades in Jesus' life. Through scripture, we are transported to the shore of the River Jordan to witness the beginning of Jesus' ministry at the moment of his public baptism. How appropriate it is for us to receive this scripture at the beginning of our new year. It is a scripture that calls to us to a new beginning and to recommit ourselves through the remembrance of our own baptism to stay faithful to the teachings of Christ this year and in all the years to come. Although Jesus' baptism is also told in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, each are a little different. There are some significant pieces in today's scripture that I do not want to leave undiscovered, hidden gems for us, but ones that first century hearers would recognize. One being the river. Having Jesus stand in the same river where the Israelites crossed over from slavery into the promised land is significant. That river is a symbol of God's promises kept, God's love and freedom. That's the water Jesus is immersed in. Having John the Baptist is also significant. What do we know about John? Luke tells us John was Jesus' older cousin, born of Elizabeth and Zechariah. John chose the wilderness to live in, wearing scratchy camel hair clothes and eating bugs and wild honey for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He removed himself and his followers from society and took them to live outside of it. He was the leader of an alternative movement with a call to repentance. But John did more than turn his back on society. He publicly criticized King Herod's lifestyle, leadership, and very rule. John preached that change was on the horizon. The Oxford commentary on this passage of scripture states John encouraged all those willing to be baptized as a symbolic act of cleansing to indicate realignment with the will of God in forgiveness. John confesses today to his followers that he isn't the long one the one longed for who will save God's people from oppression. No, he isn't even worthy to be the servant of the one God is sending. John is baptizing with water, but when the Messiah comes, he will immerse them, surround them, flood them, fill them with the very energy, spirit of God, which is divine love. Then... We have verse 17, all about harvesting wheat, another symbol of life in those days, a dietary supplement, a staple, a symbol that all the hearers would understand. John states that the Messiah is going to gather the stalks of wheat and separate wheat berries from the chaff. So I googled images of wheat, wheat berries, and chaff. Chaff is the husk that holds and hides the grain as it grows. John continues to say that the Messiah will gather the wheat berries but burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. That sounds quite harsh indeed. But as one who gardens vegetables, I know sometimes only a small fruit or seed on a plant is harvested. The rest I discard into the compost. As I reflected on this passage, I think this is what John means. The separation of the chaff and the wheat isn't a judgment Jesus is making to a group of people. You're good wheat, you can stay. 
You're a bad chaff, you're going to be burned. I have heard this interpretation before. This doesn't seem to be a heaven prize or a hell punishment image to me. But instead, a harvesting that Jesus will begin within each person. Jesus is not a judge here, but a loving and caring farmer. Jesus is going to take his followers on a deep journey within, beginning where John left off. This wasn't about forgiveness and repentance alone. This was about internal transformation that would lead to systematic change. In other words, Jesus is going to free people from those methods, ideas, habits that we all have created within us that keep us separated from God. Through Jesus, all our best devotional qualities, all our spiritual talents that can be used for justice and mercy, all the patience and compassion and love that we have will be harvested, gathered, and implemented for a new beginning, a new life, the reign of God. At the same time, those feelings that we have of unworthiness or our egoism that holds us apart from one another, our fears and desires that cause us to act in ways that hurt others, all of that needs to go. This is the transformation that begins in baptism. The grace of God working intimately within us so we may each grow in love. As the scripture moves back its focus into the river, Luke tells us very simply that Jesus was baptized. So simple. But by doing so, he turns a ritual into a sacrament, a direct way that we can communicate with him. There is a watery thread, a living, flowing stream that will forever connect Jesus to all who are baptized from that moment on, from Jesus to Maxime. That is the good news. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus goes off to pray. That's different in Luke. It's on dry land, not in the river's water, that the barrier between heaven and earth opens and the Holy Spirit pours out, pours out upon Jesus. And the heavens declare... You are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is claimed at that instant as God's very son, whom God loves and who God affirms. In the United Church of Christ, we profess that baptism is an outward and visible sign of the inner grace of God made manifest in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that draws the best each of us has to offer and uses those gifts through grace for the coming of God's reign here on earth. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are united with Christ, each other and all Christians past and present into the body of Christ. Baptism isn't a single moment in time, but a continuous flow of grace as we develop into all that God has created us to be, God's beloved, together. Each time we witness a baptism, or even wash our hands, shower, swim in the ocean or pool, watch the rain or take a drink of water, is an opportunity to remember a God who calls us beloved and claims us as God's own. In the course of our daily life, the recognition of the gift of water can transport us into the sacred waters of our baptism and connect us with Christ by just prayerfully tuning our minds and hearts to be aware of those moments of divine connection, and they are abundant. Today, in remembrance of our own baptism and to recommit ourselves to following the teachings of Jesus, we will soon renew our baptismal vows by aspersion 
or the sprinkling of water. Pastor Aaron and I will walk around the sanctuary and using a green branch, a symbol of new life in Christ, we will sprinkle the water infused with the Holy Spirit, water that has been blessed by our prayers and our songs and our worship upon you. Brothers and sisters, let this moment of grace fill all the places of emptiness within you. Allow this water to nourish your continued spiritual growth. And if you don't remember your baptism, then take this moment into your heart and drink deeply of the Spirit washing over you today. If you have not been baptized, then I invite you to consider this moment an invitation to begin a closer walk with God. Will the congregation please rise in body or spirit? Family of God, as I ask Maxime's parents, I ask you now, Will you continue to learn from the wisdom of the prophets, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with your God? If so, please respond, I will. I will. will you continue to foster within yourself an appreciation for the life and teachings of Jesus in concert with an appreciation for diverse religious traditions? Will you continue to honor the faith questions that belong to you throughout your life? You may be seated. Receive now this gift of water infused with the Holy Spirit as a sign of God's grace and reaffirm your participation in the body of Christ this day.
rise as you're able. Take a slow breath in and let it out and hear these words. You are a child of God. You are the beloved.